Thank you, Sharon. And um, so as a commentator, um, I think I have probably eight or ten minutes at the most to um, uh, comment on Sharon's paper. And I think what I'll do is I'll say something about the negotiations taking place in the IGC, the committee that Sharon and I think others have, have mentioned, um, and just give you a quick um, sense of the challenges and possibly the prospects of the work that's being done there. Member states of WIPO are undertaking text-based negotiations. Uh, this is an extract from the mandate uh, of the committee with a view to developing the text of an international legal instrument or instruments which will provide for the effective protection of the three issues being dealt with in the IGC, traditional knowledge, genetic resources, and expressions of folklore, or as we more recently uh, call them, traditional cultural expressions. As Nick mentioned, this is a, a process that has been ongoing for uh, 10 years now, more than 10 years. The IGC first met in April 2001. It has just completed its 19th session. Uh, it's not an easy process, and let me try to give you some of the reasons for that. The first is that there are a wide variety of constituencies or stakeholders that take part in the IGC and each with their own interests and objectives. Principally, we have countries that are rich in biodiversity, which we might call the provider countries. Uh, we have countries that have technologies that can exploit that biodiversity. We can call those the user countries. We have indigenous peoples. We have the private sector and we have other interests, other users of TK and folklore and so on, such as libraries, archives, museums, etc., etc. And each of these stakeholder groups have their, has their own ideas as to why the work is going on. What is the, the answer, the question that Sharon raised, the why? Why protect TK? At a higher level, there are different goals in people's minds, economic, political, cultural. Uh, it, for some, it's about respect, recognition, and reward. Uh, one of the uh, consistently difficult issues is drawing the distinction between the preservation of intangible cultural heritage, which is not the work of WIPO, not the work of the IGC, it's the work of UNESCO, uh, and the legal protection, so the protection in the intellectual property sense of creativity and innovation against uh, misuse and uh, copying and unauthorized use by third parties. One of the other differences, uh, distinctions to be drawn is between those that believe that TK ought to be protected by IP, what we call a positive right, and those that believe that TK ought to be protected against IP, a kind of defensive protection. Again, all of these things are possible, but because of the diversity of stakeholders in the process, uh, the differences in their different objectives, and quite frankly, there hasn't been a proper discussion in the IGC uh, as to the why question. There's still a lot of fluidity that underlies the work that is going on. Another difficulty is that these issues are being discussed and negotiated on in multiple fora at the same time. So we've had references to the CBD from 1992. Last year there was adopted the Protocol of Nagoya, which is a protocol to the CBD. The FAO has its own international treaty uh, on plant genetic resources for food and agriculture. Uh, there are discussions, of course, in the WTO more generally and particularly in the TRIPS Council and UNESCO, WHO, UNCTAD, ITU. They all have their own uh, processes going on and that makes it very difficult actually for national governments to develop coherent views because the issue is being dealt with in such a fragmented, in such a fragmented way. And then the other issue, of course, is that what's being done at WIPO is its international legislative 
work. So it's, it's, inter it's, it's international in the sense that it's top-down. It's, it's an attempt to, at the international level, create some sort of international framework or instrument that will inform national laws of those countries that ratify the instrument or the framework that comes out of the process. There's actually very little experience at the national level with these issues. So some 50, 60 countries, many from Africa, have protected folk law in their national copyright law since independence, since the 1960s. But quite frankly, it's not clear to what extent those laws have worked. And there's very little empirical evidence um, that they have generated benefits and to whom the benefits have gone. More recently, there are countries that have enacted more contemporary um, national systems dealing with all three subjects. Um, Peru would be an example. Uh, South Africa has a draft bill before Parliament. The South Pacific countries have adopted, uh, have adopted a model regional national law. India, Costa Rica, Ecuador, I think, is working on these issues as well. Um, but these are fairly new laws. The law from Peru is from 1999, one of the first of the newer uh, sets of laws, but that was only 11 years ago or 12 years ago. It's not a lot of time with which to measure uh, how effective these laws have been. And there's this tension between you know, what is better, top-down or bottom-up, and, and another thrust of our work is helping countries to develop national laws and trying to work with them at the national level and at the local level to try to, to try to work the issues out because that in a, in a sort of dialogue way can inform the work at the international level as too. So it's top down and bottom up at the same time. There's two other issues that I won't cover in any detail. One is about participation uh, in the process uh, and the other one, as I've touched on already, is that this is an attempt to protect TK through legislation, in this case international, but there are also many practical things that one can be doing that can also protect TK, databases, the use of contracts, protocols, and so on. It's a fascinating process. For those of you who have followed it for um, many years, it's a fascinating process. It's not just about TK. It's actually a forum in which, quietly on the side, uh, since 2001, member states and civil society, indigenous peoples, have been rethinking some of the very fundamental concepts and principles that underlie the IP system. The public domain, what is it to be original, what is an author, etc. And it, therefore, the discussions in the IGC have ramifications beyond just TK. TK is important, but it's, it's actually, it, it ripples out and it affects or will have an impact or is having an impact, I think, on other discussions outside of the IGC on the future of the IP system. There's a reimagining of some of the basic concepts uh, in, the I, in the IP system. And it's not about forcing TK into the conventional IP system. It's rather about digging deep into the, into the IP bag and rediscovering some of the old principles that underlie the IP system, namely that creativity belongs to the author and shouldn't be misappropriate, misappropriated by a third party, and redeploying some of these old values, rethinking them, refreshing them in a new context. The IGC had some very difficult years uh, in the middle, uh, sort of 2003 to 2009. Uh, there has, however, been a, a change in the atmosphere in the IGC. Uh, there is mistrust, I think, between the, the stakeholder groups I mentioned before, but there's a, a narrowing of that trust gap, and there's a, a much more collaborative and working atmosphere in the IGC now. Again, that's a different discussion. It's a, it can be a long one. The work of the IGC, the work on these issues, is also an opportunity for intellectual property to, be, to, ref, to show mutual supportiveness with the objectives of other, in other policy areas. I'll touch upon this a little bit later. But it's an opportunity, and I think it's an important one, 
for intellectual property not to see itself as an isolated technical area that is unaffected by and doesn't affect other policy areas. It has an impact in the areas of the conservation of biodiversity, cultural diversity, access to health care and so on. And I think it would be very helpful and very good for the IP system to adapt itself in such a way that it's seen to be supportive of these other areas. And then finally, it's an historical opportunity. This is the first comprehensive international intellectual property normative exercise, normative process that developing countries have initiated and are leading. And I think it's, uh, it's and if agreement were to be reached among all the member states of WIPO, it would represent a significant shift in, in international intellectual property, perhaps the most significant shift since the TRIPS Agreement of 1994. Let me mention where we are in the process, and there are draft uh, international texts, both on traditional knowledge and on traditional cultural expressions. These are sui generis systems. They each comprise 11 or so articles dealing with the 11 or so key issues that any international or national law would need to deal with. Definition of subject matter, beneficiary, scope of protection, exceptions, management of rights, and so on. But despite the difficulty of the process, uh, we do now have, and for the first time in 10 years, uh, we do actually have negotiating or negotiable texts uh, that are sort of short and slim uh, in front of the IGC. Yes, the articles contain brackets. Yes, they, can, they contain options. Uh, but of course they do. Um, but there's now a focus uh, for the work. And I have in celebration of the 10th anniversary of the IGC, um, we put all the documents of the IGC, the first 19 sessions, on a little card like this. I have some with me. If you'd like to take one, you're very welcome. Help yourself. <laughs>